Hi, it's Jules here again. So as promised, here is some more information on fat and how to get slim. This is part two of the presentation. Please read the disclaimer again. This information is for informational purposes only and not designed to diagnose or treat any condition. If you are going to make any changes, please consult with your doctor. Again, for those of you who don't know me, I trained initially as a podiatrist. I have a degree in psychology and communication. I studied kinesiology healing modalities, exercise science and sports restoration therapy at FITS, health and nutrition through the, the, through the UK, functional medicine through, through the United States, and my sub-studies include detoxification, hormones and sexual health, insulin, stroke and genetics, and of course how genetics influences all of our health issues. So as promised in the last lecture, I want to talk about leptin. Now, in a similar way to insulin. So insulin is a hormone, it's a messenger, and it tells the body to store energy. Leptin is also a hormone, so it's also a messenger. And leptin has a slightly different response in the body to insulin. What leptin does is it gives the brain information so that the brain can direct other hormones to do things like adjust metabolic rate, for example. So leptin is almost a master directing hormone to the brain. So the brain can then feed through other metabolic responses. So to give you an example, when leptin levels are high, it will direct the brain to feed through to the thyroid that the leptin levels are high, there's lots of food, and the thyroid can increase your metabolic rate because you can burn more food. The reverse is also true in a situation of leptin resistance, which I'm going to talk to you about just now. So basically what leptin does, the message that leptin tells the brain is that you're full. So when, you've, when your leptin levels rise, which they do during the meal, at some point, it's going to tell your brain, okay, there's food coming in now. You can shut off the hunger signal and you can stop eating. As soon as this message comes through, the brain will tell the pancreas to shut off insulin. And that's good because remember when we discussed insulin resistance, you don't want this constant flow of insulin bathing the cells and causing insulin resistance. Leptin is made by the fat cells. So when the fat levels rise, so if you think back to the previous lecture, I said to you, insulin will trigger a certain amount of the glucose to store as fat. The fat levels rise a little bit. As soon as the fat levels rise, leptin is triggered and leptin tells the brain, okay, fat levels are rising. You don't have to panic. You're not in survival mode anymore. You can increase the metabolic rate. You can burn more fat because there's enough fat. So the slight increase in fat is going to increase the, 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 the trigger to leptin. But leptin resistance happens in the same way that insulin resistance does. When leptin is constantly flowing, in other words, if you are carrying too much fat, or if you're insulin resistant, because leptin resistance and insulin resistant go hand in hand. But basically, if there's too much fat and there's lots of constant leptin flowing, then the cells do exactly the same as with insulin resistant resistance. They just become leptin resistant. So then, if the cells are, are resistant to leptin, the brain can't hear the message that the leptin's telling the brain. And the brain thinks that there's no food coming in because the message is not getting through that there's food coming in so that you can stop eating. So it triggers the hunger signal even after a meal. So soon after a meal, you're hungry again. You basically don't feel satisfied. And because leptin resistant is not getting, the leptin is not getting into the brain, the body thinks that there's a starvation coming and it needs to lower the metabolic rate so that you don't burn all your energy stores and there isn't enough to keep your heart beating and your lungs working and your body detoxifying. So it's really a survival response. And basically, leptin doesn't care if you're 20 kilograms overweight. It doesn't know you're 20 kilograms overweight and there's lots of fat because the problem is the resistance to leptin in the brain. It's not it hasn't got to do with the amount of fat you're actually carrying. So leptin only responds to the sensitivity of the message in the brain.
Now, a normal leptin response in lean time, so in other words, when there's not a lot of food coming in, and your stored fat levels start to drop. Because leptin is made in fat and stored in fat, your leptin levels are going to drop as well. And when the leptin levels drop, the message to the brain says, slow down the metabolic rate because stored energy is starting to drop. And again, the body's all about survival, so it slows the metabolic rate, so there's enough stored energy left behind, hopefully, for the body, so that your heart can beat and your metabolic processes can work. When you eat again, fat levels are going to go up, your leptin levels are going to rise, and the message to the brain is, you can burn lots because there's food coming in. Now, I know the question for a lot of you is, I've got lots of fat, so why am I exhausted? In other words, why is my metabolic rate so slow? And why am I not burning madly? Because if that's, if this is true about leptin, then if I've got lots of leptin, my metabolic rate should be through the roof and I should be burning madly. And of course, this is not the case. And the answer is, as I've mentioned, leptin resistance. So let's do a little reality check. Yeah, so I think this has probably happened to us all. Let's say we look at ourselves and we find we're 10 kilograms overweight. So we decide to go on a diet. We chat around a little bit. We talk to our friends. We have a look on the internet and we sort of reckon that we've gained the weight because we've eaten too much. So now we're going to go on a calorie restricted diet and we're going to lose that weight again. So initially we lose some weight. We've, we've now hardly eaten anything or we're eating low fat, low cal foods and we lose some weight. So we're very happy. We carry on for a few days. What happens with leptin is after about a week, it's actually just over three days, leptin then registers that there's less food coming in. The leptin reacts to this and it sends the message to the brain that there's a little bit of starvation happening here and the brain then messages the thyroid and the metabolic rate is lowered. Now what happens is that our metabolic rate is burning less energy and but now we're eating the same. So our weight plateaus out. So we look and we think, okay, well, we, we managed to lose maybe a kilo or something in the first week. And now our weight has plateaued out. So we're going to work a little bit harder. We're going to cut down even more. And we're going to carry on losing weight. So we cut back on our food. We lose a bit more. But exactly the same thing happens. After about three or four days, sometimes a week, leptin reacts to the lower cal coming in so the lower nutrient intake it reacts again and your metabolic rate drops still more now because our metabolic rate is noticeably slower we're tired because our energy is is low we are grumpy we're ratty we've got brain fog we're not feeling great we're a little bit depressed and we then there's something happens and we break our diet then because our number one our metabolic rate is low our body's not burning at the same rate and secondly, leptin now registered there's food coming in. It goes into almost like an emergency stock up situation. We gain weight, even though it might have taken us months to gain that weight the first time and a couple of weeks to lose it. Now it takes us a week to gain it again. And we're back to where we are in the beginning. And over the years, if we look at these cycles over the years, our weight gain over the years probably looks a little bit like that. We, we, for pregnant, we eat a little bit more, we're not watching what we're doing, we, we're tired because we're dealing with children or we're very stressed at work, we gain a little bit more weight over the years. Perhaps our, our, our diet is, is just not as healthy as it used to be or as we're getting older, we're not as active maybe as we used to be. Because of what we're eating, our insulin begins to overflow and over time we develop a mild insulin resistance. This, as I explained previously, triggers your LPL, your lipoprotein lipase, and it inhibits your hormone-sensitive lipase. Now the fat is well settled in the cells. Leptin also overflows, causing leptin resistance. So we're now insulin resistant and we are leptin resistant and as a result of that we develop a slower metabolic rate so now even when we are eating that lettuce leaf we're gaining weight it's much harder to lose weight and we feel guilty and actually we feel awful when we try because our energy levels are low and we're exhausted 
So very often, because we try out, we might try for a day, we might try for two days, we feel so bad that you keep putting it off. The weight still creeps up. The energy levels are dropping, so we're feeling sluggish. We're not exercising because we feel we have low energy. And we decide, okay, I'm going to go on a January diet. And we're going to be like super strict. We start our diet at the beginning of January and leptin promptly whacks us thoroughly. So we give up again. We feel like a failure because we've got too little willpower where we don't realize that in actual fact our hormones have sabotaged our success. We feel fat, we feel unhappy, and now of course we get worried because of the health risks. So when we're looking at action, what to do when we are trying to lose weight, the common choices are crash diets. Crash diets are your worst possible choice. Injections, I think, are equally bad because they really don't address the root cause. And in actual fact, if you have injections and you say to your doctor, what's in this injection? They always say to you, it's proprietary information. And often it's thyroid stimulating and you don't want to stimulate your thyroid if your thyroid is working fine. And I will address that in another lecture. You don't want to stimulate your thyroid with an exogenous source because then the thyroid gets lazy. We, we, all what we do is we do a calorie controlled diet and we increase our exercise. Now, increase the, I read a little saying once, and it was that you can't outrun a chocolate chip cookie, and that's actually true. If you want to lose weight, you can increase your exercise, but you can never increase your exercise enough to actually counteract that chocolate chip cookie that you're eating. So maybe we go on a banting diet or a combination. Banting diets, there's definitely some substance to them. Um, um, sometimes ketogenic diets, depending on where you are, what's good for you. Sometimes our, our struggle to lose weight is related to a thyroid problem that needs to be investigated. Sometimes it might be um, a genetic issue that also needs to possibly be investigated. Sometimes it's just poor habits. You know, we don't know what are the right habits. Very often it's an inflammatory situation where you might be allergic to certain foodstuffs or sensitive to certain foodstuffs such as gluten or dairy. That needs to be investigated. And generally the combination, you has to look at you as an individual to see what are your issues as an individual and then try and find a path that's going to be the best path that is number one sustainable and number two is obviously going to get going to get you the results so overall the effects of calorie restriction you can see i'm not pro calorie restriction at all it lowers your metabolic rate it lowers your overall energy it makes you lethargic and depressed the response is very poor as far as weight loss is concerned it's unsustainable you can't keep on for months with that, you get hungry and unhappy, and it's a vicious cycle. The complications. So in a system where we're eating less and forcing ourselves to exercise more, it leads to a higher nutrient demand, but a low nutrient intake. Basically, we are overfed, but undernourished. In a situation like that, the body will take the amino acids it needs from your muscles. So it depletes the muscles. And when you have a muscle wasting, it's called sarcopenia. With a muscle wasting, your immune function's function is going to go down. Your mitochondrial function goes down because your mitochondria need magnesium. They need the vitamin Bs. And if you are on a low-cal diet, invariably you're not getting the nutrients in just to keep your mitochondrial function working well. And it increases your risks of, risks of weakness and illness. Hunger, of course, is the enemy to health and weight loss. Feeling hungry where you can chew your own arm off makes diets completely unsustainable. And hunger is, of course, caused by insufficient, not only insufficient calorie intake, but insufficient nutrient intake. So if you are eating very low nutrient dense foods, but they might be high in calorie intake, but your body perceives you perceives it as starving, so you're going to eat more. And as I mentioned, it's overfed and undernourished, and the results impact on all your organs and all your systems. So it results in depression, you're not motivated, you become obsessed with food where you think about it all the time, you're exhausted, and really, you know, life is just absolutely not worth it, worth going through this. And then you have this rebound gluttony where you just like a piggy in the trough and you just eat everything in sight and then you you beat yourself up and it's not your fault it, it it's it's the way the hormones are reacting in your body and one needs to address the hormones first i just want to quickly look at the benefits of exercise so when you when you're on a low cal diet and you're eating low protein it causes the muscle wasting which is the sarcopenia and it it, it changes the ratio of fat to protein so You've got more fat to protein, and that's a ratio, not rations, sorry. Your metabol metabolic rate drops, your energy rate drops, 
of course, then you don't feel like exercising and then your muscles get weaker. And remember that muscles burn energy much faster than fat. So if you've got very dense muscles, you're going to be burning energy faster than fat. So exercise promote programs also promote your muscle uptake of sugars directly. So this is very good because then if you do cheat a little bit, when you exercise in the muscle pulls the sugar into the muscles. So you don't immediately have a situation where the sugars are being driven into the fats by insulin because exercise is helping the sugars go straight into the muscles. And also the exercises make the muscles more permeable so that they can take up sugar and no extra insulin is required. Because remember from the first lecture, how the body responds to excess insulin from a fat perspective. In next month, we're going to address intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a fabulous way of monitoring your insulin. So I'm going to discuss that in much greater detail next month. And I love intermittent fasting. And those, those of you who've actually spoken to me about these issues, you know, I always promote intermittent fasting because it's efficient, it's easy, and it's very effective at reducing insulin. So if you need to contact me, if you have any personal issues you want help with, you can contact me on health at live to 100.co.za you can go on the website www.live200.ca.za and subscribe and as i say for any additional support for your unique body please contact me i'd love to hear from you and please contact me if you've got any requests of talks that you feel would benefit you